Well, this morning, good, okay. This morning, we're continuing in our study of Matthew. Matthew's fifth section, which I have said is basically from about halfway uh, through chapter 16 until most of the way through chapter 20. And I've titled this section, The Suffering King Explains His Kingdom, because I feel like that summarizes the major topics of this section pretty well. And now we are in the final portion of that fifth section. So this is the last leg of our journey through the fifth section and the last leg of Jesus's journey to Jerusalem, which is one of the big plot uh, elements of this part of Matthew, Jesus on his way to Jerusalem for the last time in his ministry. This has been his destination the whole time, going there, as he has said several times, to die and rise again. And on the way, the fifth section here of Matthew really is Jesus giving his, uh, his best effort to teach about his kingdom to his disciples because they're soon going to be without him. And here in this last portion of the fifth section, we have his final weighty explanations about his kingdom. And today's passage is one of those. So let's go ahead and read it. The passage today is chapter 20, verse 20. And I'm going to read all the way through uh, verse 28. And the two of the prime characters here are the sons of Zebedee. Those are James and John, two of Jesus' disciples. So they're not actually named, but that's who they are. So those are the sons of Zebedee, otherwise known as the sons of thunder. And you get some of that attitude here in the uh, passage in front of us. Matthew 20, verse 20. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and one on your left. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, my cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right hand and my left, this is not mine to give but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And hearing this, the 10 became indignant with the two brothers, means they got really angry. They became indignant with the two brothers, but Jesus called them to himself and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great men exercise authority over them. It is not this way among you, but whoever wishes to become great among you shall be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you shall be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So what I just read there is really one passage. It flows through all of its parts very neatly. It's very much you know, happening there probably at one time, one place. However, this passage does move through two distinct phases. You can chop it in half right in the middle. The first phase is Jesus' answer to James and John after their request. Their request made to Jesus by their mother, but still their request. And Jesus responds to that. The second phase is Jesus' answer to all of the disciples after the other ten grumble against James and John. So there's sort of another incident, and Jesus responds to that as well. It all happens very quickly and is all recorded together, but there's still two phases there, and each phase really does have its own main point. As I was looking over this and trying to think of how to teach on it, it really had to fall into two halves because each half had its own agenda. And so that means I have two messages to preach on this passage, one for each phase of the story. So today I'd like to focus on the main point of the first phase, which again is the uh, request made by James and John and how Jesus responds to it. So that's where we're going to focus our attention today. And then next time when I teach, I'll get into the next half of this passage and handle the second phase. Now the title that I came up with for today's message is Pride, Pain, and Predestination. 
And not only does that alliterate very well, but all three of those things are seen in the passage. Pride, pain, and predestination. And my main point, as I sent it out in the email that I send to some of you uh, for preparation purposes, uh, the main point is that Jesus shows how spiritual pride is humbled by suffering for Christ and by God's sovereign decisions, which is a very full main statement there. So to read it again, Jesus shows how spiritual pride is humbled by suffering for Christ and by God's sovereign decisions. And to unpack all of that, I have four points. So I will let you know what those are here at the beginning, and that should help you follow along. First, James and John show great pride in asking for the two greatest positions in the kingdom. So here there, there's the pride part of the pride, pain, and predestination title that I gave. Secondly, whatever claim to greatness these brothers may have had, it is undermined by the earthly way they try to claim this heavenly greatness. And they're focusing specifically on having their mother come and ask Jesus this question, this request. Then thirdly, Jesus humbles the pride of James and John with the knowledge that they can only earn greatness through suffering. And there comes the pain of the pride, pain, and predestination title that I gave you. And then if you're wondering where the predestination comes in, it's in point number four. Jesus humbles them further by showing how little their sufferings will actually do for them. And this is where we get into the last part where Jesus talks about how these two positions have already been prepared by God for whomever. So those are my four points here for my outline. And as I go through the message, I have a question for you to ponder. I sometimes do this to help you give the whole message some coherency, some cogency. And the question I have for you is, how do you humble a proud Christian? So that is the question you can be considering. How you, can, how you humble a proud Christian, which of course should be something of an oxymoron. There should not be a proud Christian, uh, but it does happen. You know, it happens probably at some point in nearly every Christian's life, reaching a point of just a real problem with spiritual pride and those kinds of things. And there comes a need, if you know such a person, to humble them, to bring them back down to their appropriate uh, recognition of what they actually are and what they are not. So how do you do that? How do you best humble a proud Christian? Well, you might do that by reminding the person of their own lingering sinfulness, all the ways that they do not yet measure up to the standard that Christ has set for us. Maybe you'll remind them of what they were like before their conversion and show them you know, that they were like this, only by the grace of God are they otherwise, so therefore no reason to be proud. Or maybe you'll remind them of all the times they were not nearly as great as they think they are. You know, really take a uh, sort of active, hostile approach and say, well, what about this, huh? Where's all your pride then? And just really let them have it in that way. You could do all those things. Any of those are ways that pride has been humbled among Christians. But in this passage, Jesus humbles the pride of two of his disciples in a somewhat different way. He doesn't really follow any of the methods I just laid out. Uh, to you in brief. He uh, shows a very different way to humble spiritual pride than what normally occurs to us. And I'd like you to be considering that as I go through the message. I'll come back to it again at the very end. So let's do that. Let's go through my four points as we go through this passage. So number one, James and John show great pride in asking for the two greatest positions in the kingdom. And of course, I'm talking about the two great positions being uh, sitting at the right hand and left hand of Jesus. Again, to read their request, put through their mother, of course. The mother of the sons of Zebedee came to Jesus with her sons, bowing down and making a request of him. And he said to her, what do you wish? She said to him, command that in your kingdom, these two sons of mine may sit one on your right hand and one on your left. That's the request. Now I'd like to make sure that something which is quite possibly obvious actually is rightly understood, just to make sure everyone here is uh, together with me in thinking about this. And that is the right and left hand positions 
would be the greatest and best positions in the kingdom of God. It would be difficult, maybe even impossible, uh, to rise any higher than being able to sit on the right hand and on the left hand of Jesus as he is on his throne and you are on your throne right next to him, either on his right hand side or his left hand side. Just considering the picture itself should lead you to that conclusion. If you want to picture you know, a palace or castle or some place where a king has his throne set up, you walk into the throne room and the way those places are built, your eyes immediately fall on the king where he is on his throne, very prominent there in the center of everything, large and in charge. And if, just thinking about that imagery, you see the king first, if there is somebody sitting right next to him, on either side of him, your eyes are going to go to that person too, just because he happens to be right there next to the king. It's just the way your eyes work. You find the point of center focus, and then anything near there is what you notice afterward. So really, after your eyes go to the king, you're going to see anyone sitting there on his right hand or on his left hand. So it gives you some attention, doesn't it? It makes you, next to the king, of course, the most important person in the room. So it very much gives you some attention, gives you what we call prestige. Also, there's something else about that. It gives you a great amount of influence. If you're there in that kind of setting where the king is there and maybe all of his advisors and counselors and servants are there, and there's some kind of discussion or argument as to what should be done, he is going to hear most easily and most often the people sitting right next to him, probably on his right hand or on his left hand. So if you're right there, you have the loudest voice in the king's ears, and so you have the greatest amount of influence. Someone on the other side of the room who has to shout and may not shout loudly enough, loudly enough is not going to do as well in conveying his opinions to the king. But if you're right there on his left hand or on his right hand, you're going to have a great amount of influence. So the picture itself, just the very image of sitting on the right hand or on the left hand side of a king is very much... Uh, enough to convey the idea of the greatness of those positions. They are the greatest and best positions that you could possibly have. That is certainly how it was viewed among the Jews. They had this custom as well as probably every culture has had when it comes to any kind of uh, leader or great person, having the right and left hand as being so important. Just to read one passage on this where you kind of see it. Going back here to 1 Kings chapter 2, verse 19. This is uh, just after Solomon became king, and he had his mother, whom we would call the queen mother, is the technical term for that, sitting at his right hand. 1 Kings 2.19, it says, So Bathsheba, that's Solomon's mother, went to King Solomon to speak with him for Adonijah. And the king arose to meet her, bowed before her, and sat on his throne. Then he had a throne set for the king's mother, and she sat on his right so here, obviously, he very much uh, shows very great respect for his mother, even getting up from his own throne and bowing to her first. After all, she is his mother. And then having a throne set up where? Right there at his right hand so that she can sit right there next to him and talk to him about this request she has. So you see right there the right hand, the position of great prestige and great influence to talk to the king. Also, you have something that I found in the Jewish historian Josephus, as he was giving his account of Israel's history, he gets to the reign of King Saul and is talking about Saul's administration. And he says that on the right hand of King Saul sat his son Jonathan, who of course was the heir to the throne at that point. And then at his left hand sat his uncle Abner, who was the commander of his army, so his general. So right there you see the right hand and the left hand go to the heir of the throne and then also to the commander of your armies. So the two greatest positions, you know, sitting on the right hand and the left hand of King Saul. So all of that just to say, yes, the right and left hand positions would be the greatest and best in the kingdom of God. And those are the positions for which James and John have asked. They want those two positions for themselves. Now that they ask for these positions is a sign of the persistent pride of the disciples. And of course, we're thinking mainly of James and John here, but really the entire group of the disciples has a problem with this. But thinking specifically of James and John, it's a sign of their own great pride. And if this idea 
of the pridefulness of the disciples sounds familiar, it's because we've encountered it before. That's why I said persistent pride is the problem here. This is a pride that lingers. If you want to go back to Matthew 18 just briefly, you can see where we encountered this very powerfully. Matthew 18, verses 1 through 4, where Jesus discusses this sort of thing with his disciples. Matthew 18, verse 1, At that time the disciples came to Jesus and said, Who then is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And he called a child to himself and set him before them and said, Truly I say to you, unless you are converted and become like children, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever then humbles himself as this child, he is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So that situation there where Jesus has to address this uh, kind of budding pride in the hearts of the disciples with a lecture on humility, you see this kind of thing before, and it's really similar to what we see now with James and John. In chapter 18, the disciples ask their question because each of them really does hope to be the greatest someday, and they just want to know ahead of time who that is. So Jesus' answer to them at that point is to respond that they need to accept the humble status of a child. They need to accept the lowest place in the kingdom, as I explained it back then. And that is how they should think about their roles in the kingdom. And that is what Jesus said to them back then. And he also had an opportunity, Jesus did, to issue a reminder to that effect a little bit later in Matthew 19, where we again see a teaching on imitating children in the kingdom of heaven. Matthew 19, verse 13 says, Then some children were brought to Jesus so that he might lay his hands on them and pray. And the disciples rebuked them. But Jesus said, Let the children alone and do not stop them from coming to me, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. After laying his hands on them, he departed from there. So here again you have this idea that the kingdom of heaven is for those who make themselves like children lowly. The kingdom of heaven is only for those who can accept that humble status and become like children and lay aside the, whatever pride they have. That is the kind of person you ought to be in the kingdom of heaven. And yet, here are James and John once again trying to outrank everyone else, trying to jump ahead of their fellow disciples and land in the two thrones nearest to Jesus' throne in the kingdom of heaven. So James and John do show great pride in asking for these two great positions, the greatest positions in the kingdom of God. And of course, this leads into my second point, that whatever claim to greatness these brothers might have, it is undermined by the earthly way they try to claim this heavenly greatness. So there's a real disparity here between the heavenly positions they want and the earthly way they are trying to get it. Now, to admit, just to be fair, before we go any further, James and John actually have some reason to think that they might sit at the right and left hand of Jesus. This is not totally bizarre for them to ask this. This is not out of nowhere. There is some reasoning in their mind for why they might have a shot at this, at getting these two top positions in the kingdom. Let's not forget that these two men, along with Peter, are truly part of the inner circle of the disciples. You very often hear that phrase uh, by Bible teachers talking about Peter, James, and John as being the inner circle among the disciples. First of all, along with Peter's brother Andrew, they were among the first disciples. Those were some of the first disciples Jesus actually called, and James and John were right there at the beginning, so to speak. So they have pride of place for that reason. Also, Peter, James, and John are allowed to witness events that no one else sees. Uh, whether that's no one else at all, or at least no one else among the disciples, these three men get a, uh, a pride of place for being the lone witnesses to certain events. For example, the healing of Jairus' daughter was witnessed only by Peter, James, and John among the disciples. Her parents were also there, but everyone else, even the other disciples, were not allowed into the room to see that little girl healed. Also, the transfiguration of Jesus was witnessed only by Peter, James, and John among the disciples. Everyone else stood at the bottom of the mountain, and the other disciples got to fight with an angry crowd, uh, if you remember correctly, 
And then Peter, James, and John got to see this wonderful vision of how Jesus was in his actual glory. And James and John are part of that inner circle. They have pride of place in that respect, along with Peter. And not only are James and John part of that small inner circle, they also saw Peter, the other member of that inner circle, recently get a lofty position in the kingdom. They have already seen someone else among their very prestigious number promoted to a very high place. Peter was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, right? Back in chapter 16, we have that famous passage where Jesus officially gives him the keys. I explain that as being that Peter was made the royal steward, the uh, prime minister, so to speak, of the kingdom of heaven. Well, if Peter gets such a benefit, and Peter is part of that inner circle, why not James and John? Maybe there is some uh, very exclusive, very proud, so to speak, position for them to have alongside Peter in the kingdom of heaven. And hey, you know what? Maybe James and John actually have a chance to rise above Peter in this regard. Because if you remember, immediately after Peter was given the keys to the kingdom of heaven, he was also rebuked by Jesus for trying to dissuade him from his task of being crucified and rising from the dead. You know, get behind me, Satan, was his words to Peter after giving him those keys. So maybe Peter has actually been demoted a little bit. And maybe there's room for someone else to come sweeping in and claim a position even greater than Peter and have the right and left hand thrown to themselves. These could be the things on the minds of James and John as they think about this and as they make this request to Jesus. Don't forget also when uh, very recently talking to the rich young ruler and the conversations that Jesus had with his disciples after that, uh, Jesus mentioned that the twelve would sit on thrones in his kingdom. So the disciples know, all of them, all 12 of them know that there are thrones coming. Thrones. That's very much an important thing in their mind, I'm sure. And of course, you have the question here, how are those thrones arranged? Because even at a round table like King Arthur has, somebody has to sit you know, on the left hand and the right hand of the king. Somebody gets to sit closer to him than everyone else. Who is it going to be? So whereas the question was, you know, who is greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now the question is, where's my throne going to be? You know, is my throne going to be as close to Jesus as possible? Where's my throne? I want to know where I'm going to sit when we get to that kingdom and Jesus has his throne and I have mine. Where's it going to be? Is it going to be on his right hand, his left hand, somewhere else? Who gets the top positions? All this stuff has been on their mind, no doubt, because of things they have encountered, things Jesus himself has done, things Jesus himself has said. And all of this has produced in their minds, apparently, the actual ambition, hey, we might actually get there. We, James and John, sons of Zebedee, might be the two top people in the kingdom of God, second only to Jesus himself. And yet, in spite of all those reasons to think that they are on the fast track to heavenly greatness, they proceed in a ridiculous earthly way, and that they get their mother to ask Jesus for them. It's the kind of thing that really is comical. I mean, you, you read it and you just laugh at it. It's one of those things where if you were telling the story later, you would say, well, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Uh, only at the time did it seem like a good idea. I wonder how often they got razzed in the future for having their mother make this request to Jesus for them. And by the way, I am pretty sure that it's James and John actually uh, putting their mother up to this in some way and not the mother asking on her own. I don't think this is a case of typical motherly interventionism, if you want to call it that, uh, you know, helicopter parenting or whatever is the term for that. I don't think it's actually that. I'm sure she wanted this for her sons as well, but I'm pretty sure the initial thought came from James and John themselves. And I figure that mainly because in this passage, Jesus completely ignores the mother after she makes her request. Everything Jesus says after that is said to James and John. She becomes really a non-character in the story after making this request. And that's probably why Mark, in his version of this story, doesn't even mention her. She's not even there. It's just James and John coming to ask. So he considered her not even important enough to mention that she was there voicing the request. Matthew is more detailed, so he includes that. But uh, in all likelihood, it's James and John. They're the real movers and shakers here behind this request. How, and on that note, you know, having their mother do it, as silly as it sounds in hindsight 
as you think about it, there really is a kind of cleverness to it as you think about it in the moment. And I want to dissect this here and figure out, okay, why have your mom make this request for you? Well, first of all, who can resist an old woman? I mean, you have an older woman come and make a request of you. It's like, well, I mean, she has your attention. You don't want to be mean to an old lady, do you? I mean, come on, she's been through a lot. She could be your grandmother, you know, just like whatever, whatever. Or in this case, for Jesus' case, she'd be my, she could be my own mother, you know, that kind of thing. Who can resist an old woman, right? So there's one thing. She has that for her. Secondly, she's also a disciple. I know she kind of shows up out of nowhere here. We've not really seen her before. But we know that there were these women following the disciples around as they were following Jesus around, caring for their needs is how Luke puts it. You know, really this idea of these women who were there, part of the disciple team very much. And this woman, the mother of the sons of Zebedee, was one of them. She was actually present at the burial of Jesus and also at his resurrection. I will leave it to you to, you to chase down the different gospel accounts of those events and see that she is there. But she is there. If you compare the endings of the four Gospels, you'll see her again there uh, at a time when all the disciples had fled. You have this handful of women still there looking after the burial of Jesus and then going to his tomb on that Sunday to care for the body after the Sabbath. She's one of them. So she's a disciple. So she has a, an in with Jesus in that way. She's an old lady and she's a disciple. So there's two marks in her favor why Jesus might answer her, answer her request positively. Also, the mother herself knows how to generate some attention because she actually worships Jesus. And I want to use that word, worship Jesus. Now, at this point, the Bible translations differ, as they often do on this word that's in question here. If you're reading the NASB like I am, it says that she uh, bowed down to Jesus. Okay? If you're using the ESV, it says that she kneeled before him. Roughly the same idea. If you were to read the King James Version, it says that she worshipped Jesus. So, all the way to the extreme way that you can revere a person, she worshipped Jesus. And this, of course, if you uh, know any Greek by now, you might know this word because I've mentioned it often, uh, the word proskuneo. Uh, this word I've discussed many times, trying to convey to you the idea that it really does mean worship, which is important because Jesus receives this worship several times throughout the Gospels. Uh, to give you some examples that I think are most clear, during the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness, when Satan comes to tempt him, one of his temptations is he tries to get Jesus to worship him, tries to get Jesus to worship the devil, and Jesus responds with a quotation of Scripture saying, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. And the word that we translate there, worship, is proskuneo. And the way Jesus says that, it's very clear that this is something you do only toward God. Only God is worthy of proskuneo. Only God is worthy of worship. And yet Jesus receives this proskuneo, this worship, several times. Also, another passage that I find interesting, the parable of the unforgiving servant that we encountered not too long ago, where the man wants his debt forgiven, and the master has mercy on him and forgives it. But then that servant goes and hastily does not forgive one of his other fellow servants. Well, whenever the uh, first servant bows before his master, who represents God in the parable, the word used is proskuneo, you know, which is fitting because God is the one being represented by the master in the parable. But then when that first servant is confronted by that second servant, and the second servant bows before that first servant, a different word is used, implying that this is, that proskuneo is fitting for God, but if there's just two guys dealing with each other, you use a different word for bowing down. It's not worship. It's not all the way. It shows you the distinction Matthew makes between that word, proskuneo, and other words that he might use. But Jesus, again, very often just receives proskuneo. He receives worship. And so what we have here, the mother of the sons of Zebedee coming here to Jesus, an older lady, a disciple, who at this time, worships Jesus. So her request is basically an act of worship at this point. She has mingled it in with her extreme adoration of Jesus, going all the way here, worshiping him. So man, you know, she knows how to get some attention at least, knows how to really you know, give Jesus his due as she's making her request. 
That's another mark in her favor. Finally, one more thing, one more bit of cleverness on the part of this family as they uh, move in for these top two positions in the kingdom. Her approach is based on a story from the Old Testament. This is one of those interesting ways that the, uh, the Old Testament finds its way into the New Testament. I'm going to go back to 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 15. Before the other passage I read from 1 Kings earlier. This story is from before Solomon was made king. So these are the events leading up to him becoming king after David. And these events happened at the time when Solomon's brother Adonijah was actually trying to weasel his way in and steal the throne from Solomon before he was able to sit on it himself. And there's just some intrigue here. And now uh, you see Bathsheba and some other people moving in to try to guarantee Solomon's right to take his place on the throne in place of David. 1 Kings chapter 1, verse 15. I'll read through verse 21. It says, So Bathsheba went in to the king, that's David at this point, into the bedroom, and the king was very old, and Abishag the Shunammite was ministering to the king. Then Bathsheba bowed and prostrated herself before the king, and the king said, What do you wish? She said to him, My lord, you swore to your maidservant by the Lord your God, saying, Surely your son Solomon shall be king after me and shall sit on my throne. Now behold, Adonijah is king, and now, my lord the king, you do not know it. He has sacrificed oxen and fatlings and sheep in abundance, and has invited all the sons of the king, and Abiathar the priest, and Joab the commander of the army. But he has not invited Solomon your servant. As for you now, my lord the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you, to tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise it will come about as soon as my lord the king sleeps with his fathers that I and my son Solomon will be considered offenders. And of course you don't want to offend the newly made king, so it's a very tense situation for them. But think about this. Think about the story. You have a mother, a mother comes to a king and bows down to him. The king asks, what do you wish? And the mother asks that her offspring may be given a position of royal authority in preferment to others. Which story are we telling at this point? Are we telling the story from Bathsheba and the days of David and Solomon? Or are we telling the story about the mother of the sons of Zebedee? Are we telling that story? They're very similar in their basic outline, aren't they? The approach that this woman takes when she comes to ask for the right and left hand thrones for James and John is very similar to the approach taken back in the Old Testament with Bathsheba. So what you have here is an old, pious woman, disciple of Jesus, biblically, in a spirit of scripture, coming to ask Jesus to promote her sons. I mean, she's really laying it on here. I mean, she has thought this out, and she has a lot of advantages here. I mean, there is some cleverness, to some degree, in this request, in James and John putting it through the mouth of their mother, making the request this way. So James and John have certainly put some effort into obtaining the right and left hand, uh, having their mother do this, and she took it as far as she could take it, and it all seems you know, pretty uh, clever in that respect, but the whole approach, of course, is wrong. I mean, this is just a very earthly way of trying to gain heavenly greatness, which is completely improper. The whole approach is wrong, and it really is a symptom of the pride that they have in themselves thinking that they can get these positions and thinking that they can pull a fast one on Jesus and get him to give them these positions just because they send their mother in. Really is a show of their pride in this respect. So how does Jesus deal with that pride? How does he answer them? Well, Jesus humbles the pride of James and John with the knowledge that they can only earn greatness through suffering. So once again, coming back to that word and that idea in this fifth section of Matthew, very prominent, the idea of suffering. Let's read again here from our passage. Matthew 20, verse 22 and 23. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? They said to him, we are able. He said to them, my cup you shall drink. 
But to sit on my right and my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. So Jesus talks about this cup that he is going to drink, and which also James and John are going to drink, and uh, whether they knew what they were getting into or not, they're going to drink it. Now that cup refers to suffering. It refers primarily to the suffering of Jesus, and later on, to the suffering of James and John. And I'll explain to you how I know that, uh, but I really want to engage the children at this point here. I have here, kids, you may have noticed I carried with me an object to the podium. I have brought up with me a cup, okay? So, uh, which of you children, you brave, eager children, would like to drink from this cup? I see a few show of hands. I see Esther raising her hand, Silas. I see, I see Emily over there. I see Chris. I see Levi. I see Amanda. More and more. Bree. Okay, a lot of you want to drink from this cup. Tell me, do any of you know what's in this cup? Nope. You don't know. Hmm? Okay. So Jonas has a little bit of wisdom to him and realized that you, you know my tricks by now, right? I'm always doing something you can't really trust what I'm doing in, all, in these uh, illustrations here. But you don't know what's in this cup. You know, volunteering to drink from this cup without knowing what's in it, not a very wise idea because a cup could contain anything. I mean, it could contain milk, could be water. I mean, it could be some kind of juice you like, could be gasoline, could be vinegar, could be any number of things. You don't know what's in this cup. You don't want to just drink it. Well, that's the big thing you got to remember here. The cup, you should know what's in it before you drink it. And it's kind of funny seeing James and John here volunteering to drink the cup that Jesus is going to drink without knowing what it's going to be. And really, it's something that you have to pay attention to in Scripture because this idea of a cup comes... If I can get this screwed on here, I will. Maybe I need to focus one thing at a time. There we go. <clears throat> Can't multitask. Water. Yeah, there, there's just water in there. You're right. That's all it is. I would have freaked out if it was something more dangerous and got it on my hand. Uh, but yeah, the cup. The idea of the cup comes up very often in Scripture. You see the Bible use it in different ways. It's usually used to portray how God is going to deal with a certain person or a certain group of people. Uh, generally, those who love the Lord, who believe Him, who serve Him, are promised some kind of good, right? And that good is portrayed sometimes by a cup that God is going to give them, and they're going to drink it, and it's going to be a good thing. Other times you have the wicked, people that are not following God, and they are promised God's wrath. And sometimes the way the Bible talks about that is God is going to give them a cup, and that cup is full of his wrath, it's full of his anger, and they're going to drink it, and it's going to be a bad thing because they're wicked, and they're going to get the punishment that they deserve. The Bible usually uses the idea of a cup to portray that, to picture that. Sometimes it does refer to something good. just want to give you an example of this. You don't have to turn there. Just very quickly, Psalm 116, verses 12 through 13. He says, What shall I render to the Lord for all of his benefits toward me? I shall lift up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. So the cup of salvation his cup is full of salvation. Well, he'll be glad to drink from that cup, right? It's good to get salvation. Salvation is a good thing. You've been saved from something. That's one way that the Bible uses the idea of a cup for something good that God gives to his people. But more often, way more often actually, the Bible uses the idea of a cup in the other way to talk about how God is going to deal with the wicked. This is very common. Just again, give you one example here from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 25, verse 15. Again, you don't have to turn there. I just want to read it to you. Jeremiah 25, 15. For thus the Lord, the God of Israel, says to me, Take this cup of the wine of wrath from my hand and cause all the nations to whom I send you to drink it. And they will drink and stagger and go mad because of the sword that I will send among them. So here the cup is God's wrath, it's his judgment. God's going to judge the nations. And the picture for that is here, take this cup, make them drink it. They're not going to want to drink it, but you're going to make them drink it because my wrath is going to be poured out on them. That is very often how the Bible uses the word cup, not only for good things that God is going to do for his people, but more often the bad things that God is going to do for those who are bad. 
That's very often how the cup is used in Scripture. Now, in our passage in Matthew 20, Jesus talking to James and John, Jesus says that he has a cup that he is going to drink. So God has given him a cup that he will drink. So what do you children think? I ask you this question again. What kind of cup do you think it's going to be? What kind of cup do you think Jesus is going to drink here? Any ideas? You got an idea, Hannah? Dying? Okay, Hannah says dying. Anyone say anything else? Silas? Sin. Okay, you're mixing ideas together, but you're basically right. The cup that Jesus is going to drink... You know, he is going to die on the cross, and he's going to die for our sins in our place. That's the cup that Jesus is going to drink. He is going to drink the cup of God's wrath so that, uh, you know, we can be saved. That's very much the idea there. And you see this later on in Matthew, just to read the passage that is more famous. Uh, Jesus talking about his cup that he is going to drink. Matthew 26, verse 36 Let's see here. Uh, yeah, just Matthew 26, 36. This is in the garden uh, before Jesus is going to be arrested. It says, Then Jesus came with them, his disciples, to a place called Gethsemane, and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, fitting that they should be here for this, and began to be grieved and distressed. And he said to them, My soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. And yet not as I will, but as you will. So here you see the cup, and he really doesn't want to drink this cup. He'll do it if God really wants him to, but he really does not want to drink this cup. It's not a good cup. It's a bad cup. It's a bad cup to drink. So the cup given to Jesus is his suffering and death on the cross. That's how this all turns out. He is on his way to die, which goes against the way God normally deals with people. Jesus, being you know sinless, being someone that does the will of God all the time, you'd expect him to get a good cup and just drink it down and enjoy God's goodness to him. But this time, it's a bad cup, and he's going to drink it down all the way. Jesus has done no wrong and yet he's still going to be given the cup of suffering from God. And that is why I say when Jesus talks to James and John about suffering, this is his cup. When he says that, he's gonna, that they're going to drink his cup as well, that's why I say it's suffering. Because the cup that he's going to drink is his suffering. And now, as it turns out, James and John are going to drink it as well. Now, some of this might seem a little bit odd to you, especially you grown-ups who have been thinking about this for a while. You're very accustomed to the idea of Jesus drinking that cup. And we usually tie it in, just as the kids did here, with you know, Jesus' work of salvation for us. We think about Jesus drinking that cup of God's wrath so that we would not need to drink it ourselves. Right? That's very much the idea, the whole idea of salvation. Jesus as a substitute. Jesus as our representative, taking our place under the wrath of God. But then Jesus tells James and John, two of his disciples, that they are going to drink the same cup that God gave to him. Which kind of messes with the way you normally think about it. I think, I would assume so. Normally you think, ah, Jesus drank that cup and now I don't have to drink it myself. And now Jesus says James and John are going to drink it. And by implication, it's possible that other disciples may have the same lot. They too may have to suffer in ways like James and John are going to suffer in the future. It's kind of a strange way to put it. Well, the only thing I really want to say about it now, I might say more about this when we get to the uh, Gethsemane passage, is just to remind you that there are two kinds of people in the world. Only two. There are those who are destined to suffer as the enemies of God under God's wrath, and they drink a cup from the hand of God that is just full of his wrath. And then there are those who are destined to suffer as the children of God under the world's wrath. And that is, in a sense, a cup given by God because God rules all things. But it is very much the world dealing out that, that those attacks on the people of God because of their hatred of truth. And those are the two kinds of people you can be in. Those are the two ways you can receive this cup from the hand of God. You can suffer God's wrath, his own wrath, as his enemy. Or you can suffer under the world's wrath because you're a child of God 
and endure, endure hostility, endure suffering in that way. Both are cups from God in some sense, because we know that God rules all things, is in control of all things, nothing happens by accident. And both must drink of these cups, even Christians. The cup that is given them, just as it was given to James and John, to suffer in this world, to uh, endure the difficulties that come with being a Christian, that's part of it. So yes, in that sense, they're going to drink the same cup that Jesus was destined to drink. They're going to drink the cup of suffering. And yet, more to the point of what they want, the two brothers, there is no way to get to the greatness they want but through all that suffering. That is how Jesus redirects their response here. As, he, as they come asking for the great positions, Jesus redirects them to their eventual suffering. When James and John make their request, Jesus says to them, you don't know what you're asking. If you've ever heard that said to you, you know it's time to get a little bit uneasy. Because you know, you, you think you know what you want, and you think you know what it entails. And then someone tells, them, tells you, oh, you don't know what you're asking. Which means, oh, there's some bad news coming with this. There's something I didn't realize, something I, if I knew what this was, I may not have made the request I just made. And that's exactly how Jesus answers James and John at this point. The two brothers thought that they were asking for the greatness of the right and left hand positions in the kingdom of God. And that's what they wanted. They were asking for that or having their mother ask for it. What they did not know is how such positions are gained. They are gained through suffering just as Christ suffered. Christ himself, he eventually got to sit at the very right hand of God himself, but he got there through suffering and then rising from the dead. And these men, James and John, are followers of Jesus. The implication is if they want similar prestige as Jesus is going to have, they're going to have to go through what Jesus went through. They're going to have to go through that kind of suffering. They're going to have to drink the same cup. They just didn't realize it when they made this request. <clears throat> Matthew kind of gives us a picture of this. I thought it's interesting to uh, include this, so here it is. He gives you kind of a picture of this, the shared suffering, you know, suffering with Jesus to get to his right and left hand. When Jesus was crucified, if you remember, there were two thieves crucified with him on his right hand and on his left hand. It uses that wording, that expression. Two thieves crucified, one on his right hand, one on his left. That really is, in a sense, a picture of Christianity. You want to follow Jesus, you got to follow him all the way. You got to take up your cross and follow him. You want to sit at his right hand, you want to sit at his left hand. You want the prestige of ruling with him in the age to come. You go to the cross with him. You suffer with him. You drink that same cup. And that is what James and John have to face if they want to uh, get this greatness that they were seeking. It's hard to know how much they understood at that point, but uh, eventually, at least, we know they did drink that cup. They did endure suffering of their own. James was actually the first of the 12 apostles to be murdered. Uh, Stephen, uh, another disciple, was murdered before him, but after him, among the apostles, uh, James was the first to be killed. You can read about that in Acts chapter 12. As for John, he seems to have ended his life in exile on the island of Patmos. Yeah, that's where he wrote the book of Revelation. So, you know, there you are, an apostle in your old age. John the Elder, he calls himself at some point, you know, wanting to serve God, wanting to be with the Christians you know and love, but you're sent off to this island where you're going to die, and that's kind of how you end your life. So James and John, you know, they went through this. They drank that cup. They asked for greatness. They started off asking for greatness. Jesus told them they had to drink the cup of suffering first, and they volunteered to drink it. They said, we are able. Who knows how much they knew when they said that, but they said they were able, and Jesus told them that they were going to drink, and they did drink. And this is how Jesus answered them when they came, obviously showing pride, obviously trying to outrank their fellow disciples, trying to get the first two places, this is how Jesus answered them. He redirected them to the suffering that they would endure as disciples. He told them that the, the only way they can get to this greatness that they want is through pain. Which I think is a very effective answer. A proud man cannot submit himself to suffering. He just can't do it. It's beneath him. Why should I endure that? Why should I have to go through this? Look at how great I am. 
A proud person cannot go through that. So if you want to take up your cross and follow Jesus, you have to deny yourself. You have to humble yourself as a child. You have to be humble. You have to lay aside your pride. So Jesus, when he confronts them with their suffering, which in order to undergo, you have to have, have humility, I think it's a very effective way to deal with their pride there. Not the way you might normally think of it, but that's how Jesus does it, and I think it does work. In the kingdom of God, you either get humble or you get out. And that's how you answer a Christian who's trying to weasel his way forward in some kind of advanced way, trying to outdo everyone else. You answer his pride with suffering. However, there is an end note to all of this, the very last thing Jesus says in this phase of our passage. Jesus humbles them further by showing how little their sufferings will actually do for them. Yes, you go through suffering. Yes, there is greatness at the end of that. Yes, there is a reward with Jesus for those things. But in the end, it's not necessarily going to get you everything that you want, especially if you're James and John asking for the top two places in the kingdom. Look again at verse 23. He said to them, My cup you shall drink, but to sit on my right and on my left, this is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my Father. And this is where we get into the predestination element of my title that I gave you earlier. With this statement, I think there's a further humbling of the pride of James and John. He just does it in a different way than what you've seen before. Again, let's think about this here. Here you got two men of the inner circle thinking they can connive their way to the top of God's kingdom. They have reasons to think that they're going to be at the top. They have a clever way of using their mother to do it. Here they are going through all of this. Jesus wants to answer that. He answers it with suffering, of course. But he wants to give another answer to this. And so he pulls out another tool that is very effective for dealing with pride. And that is God's predestination. The fact that God has already decided how history is going to go, already decided how your life is going to go, and has already decided all of these things. In this case, including who is going to sit at the right hand and the left hand. You see, James and John are too late. They're too late. God has already prepared. Did you notice Jesus speaks in the past tense here? God has already prepared the right hand and the left hand for whomever he has chosen. Don't know who it is? At this point, don't need to know. All they need to know is, hey, guys, sorry, you're late. God's already decided. It's not in my power. I can't change it. It's God's decision, and he's already decided who's going to sit at the right hand, left hand. So, too bad. You snooze, you lose. You have uh, totally failed to gain your positions in the kingdom because God has already decided who is going to sit there. So that kind of thing, that appeal to God's sovereign decision, that he's already made up his mind, it's happening, and it's going to happen just as he said, has a way of humbling pride. Usually when you encounter it in your life, very often we encounter that kind of thing in salvation. But here also, this could humble pride effectively. It also does something that I think is interesting I want to talk about. Um, it's a helpful correction for how we should view suffering for Christ. Especially, I think, when you start to realize that Christianity brings hardships, and maybe you meet people who have endured those hardships, you have a very high view of them, right? And you might think, well, in the kingdom, surely they have a high place. Surely there is a great, uh, a great high place waiting for them, a high throne in the kingdom of God. It's very easy to think that way about things, but um, it's not necessarily that simple. I mean, here you have Jesus talking to James and John. He affirms that they're going to drink the very same cup that he is going to drink. We know that the disciples endured much. James himself, you know, being executed. Uh, John himself, differing stories about how he died, but certainly being exiled. Definitely a hard life and a hard death for both of them. And yet, Jesus says not even that is necessarily going to land them in the top places. God's already decided who's going to go there. It may not be James and John. Who knows who it's going to be? We don't know. So even, there, even though they're going to drink the cup that Jesus himself drank and endure that suffering, they might necessarily get the biggest places in the kingdom. They may not necessarily get there. 
And I consider that an important correction because in a religion of the cross, which we very much have, we could easily come to have a view of persecution and suffering that is too high, thinking that people really do earn maximally great positions in the kingdom purely by how much they can suffer. And Christians can sometimes get too enthusiastic about the whole idea of suffering for Jesus, you know, to the point where maybe they are too eager for it, where they call it upon themselves a little much. Um, we were talking about persecution in the early church earlier. Um, some stories come to mind. I mean, you have stories of Christians volunteering themselves for martyrdom. I mean, you have the government in those times usually didn't care about the Christians. They didn't like them, but they're not going to hunt you down normally and kill you. But sometimes you had Christians like volunteering to be martyrs because they had such a high prestige of that. You know, wanting to drink the same cup Jesus drank. Uh, there's a humorous story about, a darkly humorous story, about Origen, one of the church fathers, as we call them. Uh, when he was a young man, his father, who was a Christian, was actually martyred. And he wanted to join his father in martyrdom. So he was going to go volunteer himself to be killed for Jesus. And the only way his mother could stop him was by hiding all of his clothing. Uh, just So apparently, you know, willing to die for Jesus, but not willing to walk down the street naked for Jesus. Uh, he... You know, he had some sense of dignity, I guess, maybe a little too much. Uh, but just, you have that kind of thing in church history. Christians having such a high view of suffering for Jesus, they really think this is the thing to do. I mean, this is the place to be. Find out where the Christians are dying and go there, because that's how you really live it up in the kingdom. Uh, it's very easy to get that idea, but it's just not right. I mean, James and John are going to drink the same cup Jesus is going to drink, not necessarily going to get all the way to the top of the kingdom doesn't necessarily happen that way. And you, no matter how much you suffer, your suffering may not be the determining factor that sways God to reward you more greatly in the kingdom. God looks at all kinds of things in these matters. So really looking for the persecution, wanting the persecution, it's not a right attitude. I mean, Jesus even says at one point, if they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. Don't just stay there and take it. Get out of there. Go somewhere where you can have some peace and proclaim the gospel freely. And if persecution starts up there, flee to the next city. Those are his instructions. You're not supposed to be a glutton for punishment. Self-denial does not mean self-affliction. Those are very different kinds of things. And suffering does not necessarily lead you to the top of the game in the kingdom of heaven. So I think Jesus' words here are very helpful corrective in that regard. As he talks to James and John and humbles them, he also implies how little their suffering is actually going to accomplish. Even though they're going to drink the same exact cup as Jesus, they're not necessarily going to get what they want. They're not necessarily going to get the right and left hand thrones of the kingdom of God. <clears throat> and those are all the ideas I wanted to cover today. Um, to take this back to the beginning, I asked you a question. Uh, how do you humble a proud Christian? And I hope you've been thinking about that as we've been talking. Uh, we see Jesus, his own way of dealing with this, his own way of dealing with proud Christians. And uh, I kind of summarized it with my title, uh, Pride, Pain, and Predestination, how Jesus deals with the pride of his disciples by appealing to the pain they're going to experience and also God's predestination. Uh, my first point was just that James and John do show great pride in asking for the two greatest positions in the kingdom. Secondly, whatever claim to greatness they may have had, it was undermined by the earthly way they sought that heavenly greatness by asking their mother to make the request for them and how silly that really was in the end. Thirdly, Jesus humbles their pride uh, with the knowledge that they can only earn greatness through suffering. So he answers their pride with pain, you know, reminding them of what being a Christian involves and how, honestly, you can't be a proud person and endure that kind of suffering. You have to be humble. And then finally, Jesus humbles them further by showing how little their sufferings will actually do for them because God has already decided who's going to sit at the right hand and left hand and all their sufferings may not actually accomplish that for them. So all of that to say, you know, that's how you answer a proud Christian, at least the way Jesus did it on this one occasion, reminding them that... Uh, they must endure many things for the sake of Christ and that they can only do that with a humble attitude willing to endure that suffering and also reminding them that God does things his own way according to his own decisions 
and you might not actually gain anything by all the things you do, even if you suffer greatly for them. God has his own plan, and he is following it through to his own conclusion. So that is how Jesus answered a proud Christian, proud Christians on that occasion. Again, we come to this, uh, this recurring idea in the fifth section of Matthew, these hardships, you know, how often we come to these things. As Jesus, as Jesus makes his last appeals and last explanations to his disciples, as he's on his way to die, they all have this flavor of, you know, suffering, drinking the cup, and all this kind of thing. It can be very dreary. I mean, we've gone through the fifth section here, and it's just been, man, it's been wearing on me a little bit as I've been studying Matthew and just constantly coming back to this idea of taking up your cross and following Jesus. It can be a bit dreary, but think about this. It does help at least cure our pride. God cares a lot more about your heart than anything that happens to your body, and you should too. Your virtue is much more important than anything that happens in the world around you or your level of comforts or anything like that. And so at least the positive thing about knowing that you're sort of a marked man by being a Christian, knowing that the world doesn't like you, knowing that the world can turn on you at any moment, at least it gives you an occasion to be humble. At least it gives you one less reason to be proud, which is a good thing. So at least take that away with you as you think about these things and all of this stuff we're talking about, drinking the cup and suffering for Jesus. At least it humbles pride. So let's remember that as we think on this passage and remember it in the future. And of course, we're coming back to this passage next time because we have to deal with phase two of this same passage and how Jesus deals with the other 10 disciples when they become angry at James and John. But that will be next time. Are there any questions or comments at this time uh, on this part of the passage?